Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Nirav Shah. Uh, I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I am joined this afternoon with Governor Janet Mills, as well as Maine DECD Commissioner Heather Johnson. And we are all here today to provide an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state of Maine for today, Monday, June 15, 2020. I'm gonna provide a snapshot of where things stand from a public health perspective, and then turn things over to, to Governor Mills and Commissioner Johnson. And overall, today's update unfortunately begins on a somber note. Maine CDC is reporting the passing of an individual with COVID-19. She was a woman in her 40s from Androscoggin County, and her passing marks the 101st death of an individual with COVID-19 in Maine. During this difficult time, we ask everyone to remember the hardship that this individual and her family must have faced as she was grappling with COVID-19. And as always, we offer our deepest condolences to this woman and her entire family during this time of grieving. Overall, Maine CDC is now reporting 2,810 cases of COVID-19 statewide, an increase of 17 cases since yesterday. Of those, 2,495 are confirmed cases and 315 are probable cases. 317 individuals have been hospitalized and 31 individuals are currently hospitalized in the state, an increase of two from yesterday. Of those 31 individuals, 11 are in the ICU and four are on ventilators. Overall, as I noted, sadly, there have been 101 deaths associated with COVID-19 across the state. 2,189 individuals have recovered, an increase of 16 recoveries since yesterday. And of our cases, 709 are among healthcare workers, an increase of three since yesterday. Since beginning our work, Maine CDC alone has now fielded close to 9,000 calls and requests for consultation from individuals from the public and healthcare providers alike. That is on top of nearly 20,000 phone calls related to 211 that our colleagues over, I'm sorry, related to COVID-19 that our colleagues at 211 have fielded. Nearly 20,000 phone calls from Maine people have flowed through 211 asking questions about what the status of the disease is and where they could go more for, for, for more detailed information. We'd like to take a moment to thank our colleagues over at 211 for their partnership working with us to disseminate information around COVID-19 since we started. I'd also like to provide an update on some of the outbreaks in which Maine CDC has been working on. We'll first start with two out outbreaks that have just now, as of today, been closed. One is at the Durgan Pines facility, where there were a total of six cases of COVID-19. That outbreak is now closed. The second outbreak that Maine CDC closed today was that associated with the Chimbro construction site, where there were a total of 29 cases associated. Our epidemiological investigation has revealed that the likely site of transmission was not so much the construction site itself, although that may have been a possibility, but more likely the fact that many of the individuals who were working at that site shared housing as well as socialized with one another after hours. These findings underscore the fact that any type of gathering where individuals may have COVID-19 poses a risk for transmission. Even though the outbreak itself is closed, we are continuing to follow up as new and as other information becomes available regarding workplaces in general so that we can help learn more about workplace outbreaks, provide guidance to work sites across the state, and hopefully try to prevent future outbreaks. And finally, at the Nichols Manufacturing Facility, there have been two additional positive cases, bringing the total number of cases associated with their, that facility to nine. And at the Abbott Manufacturing <laughs> Facility, a total of 23 cases there. I'd like to provide a quick update on some of our public health preparedness activities next. The first is on our distribution of swabs and viral transport media. To date, we have pushed out nearly 74,000 swabs and viral transport media 
the healthcare facilities and provider groups across the state. We're continuing that process on a daily basis as swabs and transport media come into us, we put them in queue and have them slated for delivery as quickly as possible. As I've mentioned several times over the past week, our colleagues at the National Guard have continued their mission to fit test healthcare workers across the state. Today is no exception. Just today alone, the National Guard will fit test nearly 70 individuals or N95 masks. These are healthcare providers who by the end of today will be certified and fit tested in the proper use of an N95 mask, which means that they can keep showing up at their healthcare facility, keep providing healthcare to Maine people in an effort to keep all of us safe and healthy. I again would like to thank the colleagues at the National Guard for their efforts. Cumulatively, they have now tested 2,300 individuals for N95 mask fitting, and they again show no signs of slowing down. Before I turn things over to Governor Mills, a quick update on our testing. I'd like to provide an update on all of our metrics around testing, specifically around the positivity rate. I'm gonna provide an update on the point positivity rate for one day yesterday, the seven day positivity rate, and the cumulative positivity rate. Let's start with just yesterday alone. For the molecular or a PCR test that we really use to gauge our progress in any type of outbreak, there were 1,105 PCR tests conducted in Maine yesterday or on Maine people. Of those, 11 were positive, bringing yesterday's point positivity rate to 1%. Over the past seven days, the rolling average of our PCR positivity rate has now fallen to under 3% for the first time. It's at 2.99% to be precise. Again, we're moving in the right direction, similarly with our cumulative positivity rate, which is now at 4.57%, based on a total of 71,485 PCR tests. That's 71485 PCR tests that have been conducted across the state of Maine since we began our activation. These trends, again, point, show that we are pointing in the right direction, but that we've all got more to do in order to drive at least that seven-day rolling positivity rate as far as low as possible. So with that, that's where the public health situation stands. I'd like to turn things over to Governor Mills. Governor, all over to you. And uh, Gov, you, you, you are on mute. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you for the update. And some of these figures I think are very encouraging. We're cautiously optimistic about our state recovering from the virus and our state's economy recovering from the downturn we've all experienced and every state has experienced across the country in recent months. Um, you know, throughout this pandemic and uh, during our gradual reopening process, Maine CDC has monitored all the epidemiological data, particularly case trends and hospitalization rates, as you heard today, as well as healthcare readiness and capacity. And these data inform our decisions on lifting restrictions. We review those metrics every day, weekends included. We look at them in their totality. We look at them in context. We don't just look at daily changes of a single metric itself. Last month, the number of COVID-19 cases and the number of hospitalizations rose in May, particularly in Southern Maine. And in light of that trend, uh, this administration postponed the reopening of restaurants in, for dine-in service in York, Cumberland, and Androscoggin counties. We did that right after Memorial Day, after watching, uh, watching that long weekend and the trends that led up to that announcement that uh, Tuesday. That was a difficult decision. And I know it frustrated many restaurant owners who were getting ready to open earlier, understandably so. But we also moved ahead with restaurant openings for dine-in and outdoor dining in the rest of Maine's counties, the 13 other counties as scheduled. We watched that progress too. And we became the first state in New England to allow indoor dining at all anywhere in the state. Since then, what do our public health trends look like? Well, in Androscoggin County now, the average number of new daily cases has 
basically plateaued at roughly 10 cases per day. In the past week, the number of new cases in Cumberland County has stabilized at roughly 20 per day. That's a 20 period, not just per capita or per 1,000 or anything. And in York County, new daily cases average between five and seven a day now. Hospitalization rates as well have largely stabilized in all three of these communities where we had seen community spread fairly dramatically. In Androscoggin County, roughly five people at any one time are hospitalized due to COVID-19, two in intensive care, uh, roughly. In Cumberland County, hospitalizations re reached a peak in May, late May, and over the last week, hospitalizations in Cumberland County have actually stead held steady at roughly 25 people, seven in ICUs. The same trend was seen in York County where hospitalizations also peaked in late May with roughly five ICU patients and three non-ICU patients. But in the, week, the past week, however, rates have stabilized with about three patients at ICU and two non-ICU ICU at any one time. Well, the bottom line is, in light of these encouraging trends, today I'm announcing that indoor dining in Androscog in Cumberland and York counties may voluntarily resume this Wednesday, June 17, with added health and safety pr protocols that are outlined in the COVID-19 prevention checklist. Not all restaurants may be ready to open, not all may choose to open uh, this Wednesday, but I know that there are many who've been waiting anxiously for this announcement and many who have the resources to implement these health and safety measures and begin serving customers. All restaurants have a responsibility to follow the health and safety uh, measures as closely as possible, protecting their staff and their customers because the risk is significant. As Dr. Shah has explained before, indoor dining involves remaining seated at an enclosed space, an indoor space for an extended period of time generally while eating at a restaurant, for example, and that can increase your risk of exposure to COVID-19. That's why these precautions are in effect. So today I'm also announcing that effective June 19th, this Wednesday, bars, breweries, and tasting rooms are permitted to open in Cumberland, York, and Anderson Garden counties for outdoor seated service. And gyms, nail salons, and tattoo parlors may also reopen in those counties, all with added health and safety protocols. Those businesses, as you know, were already opened uh, in the rest of Maine's 13 counties. And we've been watching those trends. We think it's safe enough right now to make these changes. We're also expanding capacity limits at retail establishments statewide. Now we're proposing to, we will allow up to five people per 1,000 square foot of public space. Given the decreasing risk associated with retail shopping and the assumption an assumption, a presumption that all stores will continue to require staff to wear cloth face coverings and follow strict public health precautions. So this change in capacity limits allows stores to invite more people in at any particular time. And the change replaces the customer limits established in my previous executive order. Stores will continue to um, put signage up saying that you should wear a mask, face covering, covering, Stores will continue to have directional signals so that people don't bump into each other and you can try to preserve as much space, spacing, social distancing as possible while in a store. While these changes, re, these changes re, with these changes, reopenings are aligned in all counties now statewide. And we have reopened our economy either on a par with or ahead of other Northeastern states. But as we've said from the beginning, Every day we monitor the epidemiological data. We monitor emerging, emerging science and the experiences of other states and the knowledge and expertise of scientists across the country. And when necessary, we will adjust the reopening plan as we did today, if need be, to protect the health of Maine people and the health of our economy. As Arizona, Texas, and Florida report their highest case numbers yet. 
and 22 other states are seeing climbing COVID-19 cases. And as we reopen restaurants for indoor dining and other businesses in these areas, we all must remain vigilant. The experiences in those other states that have reopened early and seen a drastic increase in cases should be a cautionary tale for Maine and for all of us. It is possible, if not likely, that these changes we're making will result in an uptick in cases and we'll be keeping a close eye on epidemiological data as we have from the start. If a review of that data finds evidence of a concerning increase in COVID-19 cases or risks of danger to the capacity of our health healthcare system, we will move to protect main people. That could mean possibly re-implementing some of the restrictions we've lifted in order to protect the public health and safety. So I ask you, if you own a public facing business, if you work at a public facing business, please strictly adhere to all health and safety protocols, protecting your customers, protects your business and protects our economy. And to all main people, please remember to wash your hands frequently, to maintain six, foot, six feet distance between yourself and others and stay home when you can, especially if you're not feeling well, or if you're an older person, or if you have any underlying health condition. And please wear a face cloth covering, cloth face covering when you're out in public to protect others and encourage others to wear those coverings to protect you and your loved ones. If we continue to protect ourselves and protect one another by taking these steps, we can and will reopen our economy in a safe way and limit the spread of this dangerous virus and avoid, avoid a resurgence of that virus. It's entirely up to you and up to all of us. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Governor. Commissioner Johnson, anything on your end? Um, thank you, Dr. Shaw and Governor Mills. Um, we look forward to carefully opening up um, these sectors that the governor outlined. And I think uh, I just wanted to clarify one point is Wednesday, June 17th is the opening date, um, just, just for clarity. So Dr. Shaw, maybe we can go to questions. Okay, very good. Today's first question from our colleagues in the media comes from Mary Kate from WMTW. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Shaw, this question is for you. Uh, from one of my colleagues, he's saying that we're hearing from people who have been turned down when they're trying to get a COVID test for themselves, including some folks who uh, are trying to get tested after attending recent protests. Uh, but the latest order saying that anyone exposed to large gatherings could be tested. What would be uh, their best course of action and are providers allowed to turn folks down? Sure. So I'm glad you raised that, Mary Kate. We've heard from some providers as well as some individuals as well. And I'll, I'll walk through that. Uh, we have issued a standing order, which means that individuals who, for example, may not have a primary care provider, but who wish to go to a drive in testing site where you might need a doctor's order to get tested, can use the standing order that's available to them. But Maine CDC does not and continues to not stand between any particular doctor and any particular one of their patients. If someone goes to their doctor and their healthcare provider deems or determines that they do not need a COVID-19 test, the main CDC standing order does not overcome that particular healthcare provider's de denial or their recommendation. We also have similarly heard, for example, from an individual here in Augusta who uh, in a similar situation was, it was, was someone whose daughter had been or her child had been attending a protest rally and wanted to get tested, they were able to go to a pharmacy chain here in Augusta, use the main CDC order, get their test, paid a small copay, and they got their result the next day. So we've heard some concerns that have been expressed. We've also heard that it's, it's also working for folks. But I think the bottom line is that individual physicians, individual clinics, and individual healthcare systems may still have their own systems in place that determine who should get tested and who in their clinical judgment would not be tested. The main CDC standing order does not displace or replace those clinical judgments by those healthcare providers. I'm gonna turn next to Emily Tadlock at WABI. 
Hi, Dr. Shaw. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead, Emily. Great. Technology is working today. So my question is uh, about the status of the swab and swipe sites. There were supposed to be 20 of them. When will they be ready to go? Are we getting closer or? Yep. So uh, Emily, the, the short answer is that we're moving in that direction. Uh, a few days ago, we released a document for any willing and qualified entity in the state of Maine that would like to set up one of those sites and work with the state in order to, to set up a swab and send site. We set up a doc. We, we sent out a document. It's available on our website that lays out the parameters for what we are looking for, where we're looking for them, and how we'd like them to operate. It's on an open and rolling basis. So any particular entity out there that's got everything that they'd like to do, that, that they need to do in order to work with us, they can reach out, and we can, in a pretty expedited fashion, start having discussions with them about standing up one of these sites. So we're on the we're on the right track and we're on our timeline that we set out for ourselves to stand up at least 20 of these across the state. Do you have a rough estimate um, as to how quickly you could get these set up, especially with, you know, expanding and reopening in certain places? I know it's it's got to be a priority to get some of these places up and running. You, you, you use the key word, Emily, it is really a priority. Um, as we know that individuals are coming into Maine as economic and social activity are resuming we would like to get these sites stood up as quickly as possible. Right now, uh, we have we have set out in our document, we've effectively said we are open for business, we're open for discussions. We would like to talk with folks who've got the wherewithal that to set up these sites. We are ready to engage in discussions as soon as possible to start getting them stood up. Uh, right now, I know that the medical and healthcare provider community are reviewing the document. We've already heard from a few groups that are very interested, and so we're moving to set them up as quickly as we can. I'm going to turn next to Bob Evans over at News Center. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, the state seems to be in a much better situation with the PPE equipment. You're able to do more testing now. A lot of the hot spots that you were dealing with at the beginning of the pandemic a more in hand, but what is still your biggest concern or the one thing that sometimes keeps you up at night, Dr. Shaw? Oh, Governor, do you wanna <laughs> do you wanna start? I know what keeps me up at night and I suspect it's the same thing for our uh, most of our state and that is the predictions of a resurgence of this virus. Um, the fact that most uh, scientists nationwide are saying we will probably see a resurgence. And that is why we want to make sure we stockpile enough equipment, that we keep our keep an eye on our hospital capacity, healthcare capacity, and keep in place precautions that protect everyone, people working in the hospitality industry, customers, people traveling here. You know, Maine is a little unusual with the number of people coming into the state over the summer. Uh, increasing our population by 20-fold, as much as 20-fold. So that's what we've been working on and trying to anticipate how to keep people safe while keeping our economy, uh, helping our economy uh, rebound. Bob, uh, what I concur with, with the governor, uh, the, the possibility of a, a, a second wave while sort of we're, we're still sort of in the first wave or a spike, as the governor noted, other states have been seeing is definitely a concern of mine. Another concern is, uh, is Bob, you know, I've, I've, I've indicated that we at the, the state level, we're not taking our foot off the gas. We're continuing to fit test. We're continuing to push out swabs and transport media. We're continuing to test. Uh, my ask is that everyone watching right now do the same, not take your foot off the gas. Uh, for example, face coverings. There have been new data that have come out in the scientific literature just in the past couple of days that really underscore the value, the importance of how face coverings can be vital to protecting people in any type of setting, especially in those settings where physical distancing is impossible. So I, I would still ask that everybody out there in the same way that we're not taking our feet off the gas, please do the same on your end when it comes to face coverings, hand hygiene, staying physically distant from one another. For me, it's pretty simple. The face coverings, the scientific literature shows that they work. And for me, they're a sign of respect 
and kindness and community to wear a face covering anytime you're out there. I am going to, you bet. I'm going to turn next to Brooke at ABC. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Can you hear me okay? Yep, go ahead, Brooke. So as you continue to test people, um, are you working on increasing the amount of time it takes to, for people to receive their results so that they can get their answers if they have it or not? Sure. So uh, Brooke asks about the turnaround time. The turnaround time at the main CDC laboratory remains about a day. Um, by the time a sample is, is received uh, by the, to the time that it's reported out. Uh, some of the larger national laboratory chains have varying turnaround times. Some are a day or two, some are three or four days. So we've been working with them to see if they can speed up their own processing. Uh, and that's a challenge because these are operations that run tens of thousands, if not one hundreds of thousands of tests per day. But at our laboratory, the main CDC laboratory here in Augusta, our turnaround time remains a day. We don't have a backlog of tests. And, and all of that is not an accident. It's due to the hard and tireless work of our entire staff at the laboratory. They've been working seven days a week, multiple hours per day, getting samples in, running them, and reporting the results out because we know how important that information is to healthcare providers and people across the state. And because of their hard work, there's not a single backlog at our lab and results come in and te are tested and are reported out within a day. Got it, thank you. I'm gonna turn next to Kevin Miller at the Press Herald. Great, thank you very much. Um, so uh, Dr. Shaw, uh, one of my colleagues uh, last week had talked to a researcher at the Harvard's Global Health Institute, and he said that one useful tool is that for, the, for agencies to, uh, to look at the percentage of positive tests that come back uh, as a result of contract contact tracing efforts. Um, is that something that Maine CDC is looking at? And do you have any data as far as, you know, what percentage of the new daily cases we get, uh, we see these numbers come from your contact yep. tracing efforts? Yep. Yep. So we are starting to track that. I, I'm aware of those reports and I've, I've probably talked to the same individual. Um, what we what we see a lot with a, with, with a high number of our cases in Maine is that much of the secondary transmission occurs in household settings. Um, those individuals are automatically eligible for testing. They, we recommend that they get tested. So irrespective of whether they are from contact tracing, we know that once somebody has tested positive, we ask them to let everybody who's in close proximity to them know that testing is available. So in a sense, that approach, I understand it uh, from an academic perspective, practically speaking, it's already happening and already has been happening for quite some time. Household transmission continues to be a significant form of transmission for COVID-19 across the state. How much household transmission occurs really does vary. Uh, there have been different studies that have tried to quantify it uh, based on the, and it really comes down to the things that we've talked about in these meetings how close people are, density, and how long they interact with each other, duration. Uh, we've seen that in situations in Maine where, where folks are able to cordon themselves off for their families, the likelihood of transmission is much lower, and we don't see the follow-on positives, and we've seen the opposite as well. So we, we do track it, um, but the, the difficulty there is that it's already the recommendation. So determining whether it's directly the result of contact tracing or the result of just baseline recommendations that every patient is given, it's a bit of a more quantitatively difficult question. Okay, and then just one follow-up uh, question on contact tracing. I, I know you talk about this pretty much every week, but can you give us an update as far as uh, CDC's efforts to hire more contract tracers and you know, what yep. numbers we're up to now? Yep, so we, I'll, I'll get you the latest numbers for this week, Kevin, but we're continuing our, in our stepwise fashion to bring on more and more individuals in two categories. One are disease investigators, and then the other are the contact tracers themselves. Um, and as our case numbers have increased, we're bringing on more and more folks. Again, I'll get you the exact number of individuals who are currently engaged in contact tracing efforts, but we've been working with agencies across the state, not just to increase the number of contact tracers, but another critical element of that are community health workers. 
Uh, we know that it's really critical to get to get education to folks before they get tested and then while they're getting tested and then after they've received their results. The contact tracing piece only really kicks in in that third phase. But we've, we've, we're starting to work more with community health workers to get education out and also get folks sort of hand-holding while they're getting tested themselves. So we'll get you the latest figures on all that, Kevin. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna turn next to Jessica Piper at the BDN. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, two questions. First one to start is, uh, Governor Mills said that we've seen numbers stabilize in these three counties. I'm wondering if you or Dr. Shaw could address what it would take to see these numbers go down, or are we just gonna be at this sort of plateau for the summer? Like the hospitalizations, increased number of cases and capacity issues, what would it take to see the numbers go down? I guess it would take seeing the numbers go down. <laughs> I think we're, we're pleased, we're cautiously optimistic that the numbers will not go up. I guess that's the main thing. Uh, and that's why we're making the moves we're making today in reopening uh, uh, restaurants to indoor dining and other entities and other facilities and activities within the three counties where we did see community spread a month ago, uh, less than a month ago. So we keep a daily, daily uh, review, do a daily review of the epidemiological data, including everything that Dr. Shah has reported today. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll add, Jessica, that um, although there is the potential for cases to go up as we resume all forms of economic and social activity, it's not a foregone conclusion. Each of these activities can be engaged in safely. Uh, one of the ways that we can continue to drive the numbers even further down than where they are right now is to keep doing the same things that Maine people have been doing all along. Again, just in the last 72 hours or so, there have been new data that have been published about the value of face coverings and how vital they are. Um, and they seem to play an outsized role in preventing transmission as well as outbreaks. Right now, that's really, I think, one of the top things that folks across the state can do, particularly in those three counties, to keep the low levels that we're seeing as low as possible. Um, and then my second question, you just touched on the importance of face coverings. We continue to hear reports about areas where you know a significant portion of people aren't wearing face coverings at places like grocery stores. Um, with respect to the capacity limits, is there ever a time where the state would step in and say, you know, these higher capacity limits are dependent on universal mask wearing or something like that? Something's going on in the background there. Well, in a sense, they are related. We've said today that the assumption in um, allowing more customers in stores at a particular time, the assumption is that there'll be a lot more mask wearing, that the staff of the stores will wear face coverings, uh, public facing staff. There are also protocols even for warehouse workers, um, keeping their distance from one another and wearing masks and face coverings if they cannot. There are detailed um, checklists for all these entities and all aspects of these um, facilities and operations. So we're premising what we're doing today on, on strict compliance with the checklist in all respects. Great, and the last question for the afternoon goes to Amy Brown from WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shah. I have one question for each of you, please. Governor Mills, in the past, it's been suggested that any workers who may have any concerns about safety in the workplace contact OSHA with workplace safety concerns. And as I'm sure you're aware, it's been widely reported that as of the end of May, there were still some cases under investigation, but with 5,000 complaints they had at that point only issued one citation. So, and we're continuing to see outbreaks associated with workplaces as we heard earlier today. With more businesses getting ready to open and looking at surges in other places where that's happening. Do you think the state should have a workplace safety hotline of some type? Oh, a, a good idea. I had not given it any real thought, serious thoughts. So I'm, I'm happy to entertain that and happy to talk with, I know we've had some workers comp cases come in. Um, I can't give you the numbers, but we talk with John Rohde every day, every workday about the numbers he's seen. Uh, workers' comp cases involving COVID-19. 
and we talk with the uh, businesses and chambers of commerce and uh, and try to keep an open line to, to workers. It concerns me greatly that people working in the hospitality industry may see an influx of people who may not be taking the precautions they should be taking uh, and maybe the businesses or the management are not requiring those precautions as they should be requiring them. Because it's the health and safety of every person working in every one of these establishments that concerns me as much as anything else, uh, as well as the uh, uh, health and safety of customers and the public in general. We try to protect the lives and the livelihoods of Maine people in every respect. It concerns me if the statistics you just cited are true. I'm not familiar with them, but I'm happy to look at them and consider another way to make uh, another avenue to make those complaints heard, allow them to be heard and responded to in timely fashion. Thank you. And Dr. Shaw, you say it's not a foregone conclusion that the number of cases are going to increase with further opening. Are there any other states that have reopened to this extent that have not seen an increase in cases? That have not seen an increase in cases? Um, there, have st there have been regions of states that have, uh, that have not seen a concomitant increase. Uh, parts, and it, it varies greatly by re region by region. Um, but there have been parts of different states, particularly in urban areas, that have not just in the United States, but across the world, that have opened with similarly protective measures. Northern Italy, the island of Hokkaido in Japan, South Korea, Singapore, parts of Seattle, parts of the Bay Area, have all reopened with similar measures in place that simultaneously allow the resumption of economic and social activity, but with these guardrails to make sure that there is enough physical distance in place, that the face mat, the face coverings the governor wore, uh, or spoke about that folks should be wearing or are abided by, that restaurant workers are wearing face shields to protect from transmission. Those things, what we, what we know is that when taken in concert with one another, can really keep the lid on COVID-19. So while it's not a foregone conclusion, it is simultaneously a risk. As the governor noted, we're continuing to keep an eye out for the possibility that there might be an uptick in cases. If so, we're poised and ready to respond. But no, it's not a foregone conclusion. It's just a reminder that the risk is still out there, but we can also successfully navigate that if we need to. Thank you. Um, governor, that was the last question. I'll turn things back over to you. Maybe I could add New Hampshire, I think has been has opened up in a sort of corollary way uh, with Maine. And um, I don't think they've seen an uptick as yet either. So, but mm -hmm. again, it depends on the region too. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw again. Um, I think that while we're gradually reopening our economy, we are still uh, very concerned about mass gatherings. We're concerned about groups of people more than 50 or groups of people with, uh, with fewer than 50 who don't wear masks and who don't, uh, uh, comport with social distancing measures. That's still, those are still key uh, activities that can help us reduce the spread and contain this virus. We're not letting down our guard, not one bit, not one whit. And so if everyone remains vigilant, no matter what the population, what the summer weather brings, um, so many people who want to get outside and again invite Maine people to enjoy Maine as well. There are campgrounds and areas and public parks and beaches that all families should enjoy across the state of Maine. So much to explore every day, every weekend, and I hope that everyone does. Meantime, I, I just want to show Dr. Shaw, I don't know if you can see this, but um, Mary Kay and Jeff Spencer of uh, the Potter's House in Litchfield custom made this coffee cup I'm glad to share with you when I see you, along with the candy from uh, Divine Chocolates and Cape Netic. This one says, quote, we've got an umbrella and we're in a hurricane, Dr. Nirav Shah, 2020. <laughs> you have your own custom, custom forged uh, coffee cup waiting for you here, Dr. Shah. Thank well, you so that, much. I hope we avoid the hurricane. Yeah, it's very thankful that that coffee cup, that, that, that line seems like from ages ago. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, uh, I don't know if the hurricane is still over. It's still raining, uh, but, but our umbrella is a lot stronger than the one that we had just a few short weeks ago. Thank um, you, Bill. You're doing to keep us safe, Dr. Shah. 
Thank you, Governor. Um, before we adjourn for the afternoon, everyone, one brief programming note. Uh, these briefings will continue. However, we're shifting the schedule a bit. Uh, starting today, the next briefing will not be tomorrow, but will be on Wednesday. We're shifting to a Monday, Wednesday, Friday briefing schedule. It will be at the same time at 2 o'clock, and, uh, and we look forward to chatting with everybody, not tomorrow, but on Wednesday. So with that, I hope everyone has a great afternoon. As always, please be kind and take care of one another, and we'll talk again on Wednesday. Have a great afternoon.